A friend of mine invested £200,000 in me so I could fly to Washington State and attempt to count cards and make a profit. Did it work? And more importantly, was it worth it? In this video, I'm going to give an open and honest review of my experience. We're going to talk money, emotions, and I'm also going to go over some of the things that I wish I'd done, the regrets I had, and just general, like, a little bit of a review, a breakdown, a debrief, whatever you want to call it. I'm also going to tell you the story behind this clip. Before we get into anything in detail, I do want to clarify a couple of things about the money. Although a friend did invest £200,000 in me, I never had all that money just sat in my bank account. That wasn't necessary. We used a currency exchange in London to convert some of that money to $10,000 in cash, and that's what I took with me on the flight to the US. $10,000 is the maximum amount of money that you can take with you without having to declare it, and although there's nothing illegal about taking large quantities of cash on a flight abroad, it's the kind of thing which does draw a lot of suspicion if I'd taken $50,000 or $100,000 in cash, that would have been a big red flag. And even though it's not illegal, it could have caused some problems. When I got to Seattle, I opened a US bank account. This would make it relatively easy for me to withdraw quite a bit more cash if I needed it. Luckily for me, on the trip, I never blew through that initial $10,000, so I didn't have to go through the potentially tedious or difficult process of trying to convince a bank to let me have tens of thousands of dollars in cash. The arrangement with my investor was to split the winnings 50-50 with me covering my expenses. That's relatively in line with the general kind of deal that a card counter will make with an investor, although the specifics vary quite a bit. Most of the time I'd say expenses are covered by the investor, sometimes the expenses are split, sometimes the percent is different, but in general 50-50 is relatively where it's at. Speaking of expenses, here is a very rough around the edges breakdown of my costs. My flight was £333.12, which I thought was pretty cheap. On that flight, I only took hand luggage. My Airbnb costs were pretty high at £1,022.10 for the month. I definitely could have gone way cheap with this. Even just looking at Airbnb now, there are many cheaper options. Hiring a car cost £656.99. I went for the cheapest option I could find, and I was actually pretty impressed that when hiring a car in the US, it seems like you get a maybe a better standard of car than when hiring one in the UK. At least that's what my experience was. My fuel costs, I'm honestly not sure what they were. I kind of paid with a combination of cash and card at times. I didn't really keep track of the fuel, and I should have, so I don't know how much fuel is but I paid for fuel. I also didn't keep track of my food expenses because I eat every day, no matter what country I'm in. However, I should have factored this in because when you're abroad, you're obviously gonna spend more money eating out than you would normally in wherever you normally are. That brings my total expenses for the trip to roughly 2,012 pounds and 21 pence plus whatever the fuel was. In terms of winnings on the trip, I won $10,671.09 ish. I say ish because that's what I have in my record. However, it would be impossible for me to win nine cents on a blackjack hand. So I'm a little bit off there somehow, but that's what I've got written down. The first thing to point out here is, doesn't that seem kind of low? After all, I'm supposed to be a card counter equipped with 200,000 pounds to take millions from the casinos and I end up with, what, $10,000? Well, let's give that number some context and throw out any preconceived notions about how much a card counter should make. I played for just under 113 hours whilst I was in Washington, and I was there for 29 days. That works out at, I think, 28 hours of play per week, or around just under four hours of play per day if I played every single day and didn't take a day off. So if we crunch those numbers as an hourly rate, that works out at approximately $94 per hour in actual value. I say actual value because that's that's the amount I ended up making. The expected value was $7,240 or $66.25? Sense? Card counting is naturally volatile. In any given session, you could win or lose, which is why we focus on expected value, which is what we mathematically will make almost at a guarantee, given the law of large numbers and enough hours actually played. I go into this concept in more detail in other videos, but basically what that means is I won more money than I should have. In other words, I got lucky on top of the card counting. Massive oversimplification to explain the point. Given that we we're on a 50-50 split, my investor made approximately $5,335, or about a 2% return on investment, which is a small percent, but if we compare it to the S&P 500, which is an index fund, it's considered a very low risk investment. It takes a while to produce returns, but it's very safe. I think that produces 10.5% return on investment per year on average. So 2% per month is actually really good in terms of yearly and is quite good. 
All those numbers to say, I think in terms of being an investor in a card counter, it works out at a pretty good deal. If I didn't have an investor, I would invested $70,000 myself, which is money I totally don't have, but hypothetically, then I would have made a profit of $8,074-ish minus fuel costs. And of course, as you're making profit as a card counter, you can reinvest that money back in, which means you can scale up the amount you can afford to bet. And in generally, card counting scales really, really nicely. But in reality, I made a profit of approximately $2,596 minus fuel expenses, which I was happy with. Sure, it's not loads of money, but I got to play blackjack full time and make a profit. And most importantly, I didn't lose money. Before we get to the highs and lows of the trip, here is some fun data that I think you'll like. I played for a total of 46 sessions on the trip. Each session lasted just under two and a half hours on average. I had 25 winning sessions and 21 losing sessions. I was backed off 14 times and half shooed once. That means for roughly every seven and a half hours of play, I got one back off or half shoot. My average win was $1,003 and my average loss was $686. My biggest win was $4,260 in a session. My biggest loss was $2,412.50 in a session. A lot of people have requested that I talk more about my emotions and how I was feeling on the trip, so here we go. For me, playing with someone else's money I think was way more stressful and had a lot more pressure than I've been playing with my own money. I imagine that there's card counters that feel a certain sense of detachment when they're playing with someone else's money, but for me, I was so aware of the fact that it's my friend's money and if I lose it, he loses money and it could have been a lot of money that he lost. So I really felt the weight of that throughout and at no point did I take it for granted that I had this money. Every time I walked into a casino, I felt my heart rate increase. The only way I can really describe it is it felt like I was about to rob a bank. Not that I've robbed many banks. There's just this tension and these nerves and I dealt with that feeling the best way that I could, but I never really got used to it and it never really wore off. Winning money obviously felt great. It's not necessarily about the winning the money itself, although who doesn't like money? There's just something so unbelievably satisfying about legally beating a casino at their own game. I will say though, placing the big bets to win that money was not easy. There's something very difficult about betting an amount of money that is like a month's rent or something like that. It just takes a lot to place that bet, even if you know the count is high and you have the advantage. Losing, on the other hand, felt awful. If winning $1,000 is like 10 happy points, then losing $1,000 is about minus 30. And at this stage of my card counting life, I hadn't even experienced a brutal loss. The most I'd lost was $2,500, which is a lot of money to lose. However, in the scheme of what card counters go through and what I later would experience, $2,500, it isn't, compared to what can happen, as you'll see in more videos to come, I didn't know what pain was. <sighs> Using a hidden camera in a casino was one of the more terrifying things, especially for the first time when I was turning it on. Because if you're caught using technology in a casino, they may think that you're using that technology to win at the game. And if you're using technology to win at a game, that is cheating, that is illegal. So even though I was using the camera to film, if they spotted the camera, I didn't know what they were gonna do. And that was definitely something that caused me a lot of anxiety at first. In terms of the actual lifestyle, I liked it. I loved Washington State as a place. It was absolutely stunning. I only took one proper day off on the trip and I used that to explore Seattle and Seattle makes great coffee. Being by myself was alleviated by me making constant phone calls to my girlfriend and friends back home. The only times when I felt maybe a bit lonely was when I was on a long drive at night and everybody I knew was asleep. Counting cards itself can be thrilling, it can be meditative in a strange way, and it can also just be really tedious. In fact, even though card counting requires relentless focus on the game, I actually found that I could do it for hours and hours at a time without really needing a break. I think this is largely because gambling itself has built-in novelty and that novelty keeps things interesting. Being kicked out of casinos and backed off, on the other hand, was nearly always unpleasant. And you can see this obviously from the situations that are clearly unpleasant, but I think you really get a better idea of how I was feeling in those back offs on those times when I would thank the person for being polite. One moment, hang on. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for being polite. Yeah. Because in those situations, I'm just so relieved that they're being nice to me and they're not giving me a hard time. After speaking to some surveillance people, I know that some casinos will deliberately make the back off as unpleasant as they can 
just to deter card counters from coming to the casino. But if anything, this has a total opposite effect because some card counters will be out for it and they have this aggression and they hate casinos and the aggression that the casino shows them just makes them more determined to go there and take their money. Speaking of unpleasant experiences, one of the things that I was surprised about, and I haven't mentioned this in any of the videos previously, is just how often, how regularly and consistently other blackjack players would be quite mean to me. I frequently get criticized for splitting a hand that I shouldn't have or making some basic strategy mistake. Sometimes people were just really annoyed about this. This was extra frustrating for me because a lot of those times I was playing perfect basic strategy so I was actually making the correct decision yet I was being told off by other players for doing so. And I'm obviously not going to sit and have an argument with somebody about the proper way to play blackjack when I want to be under the radar as just a average blackjack player. On the flip side to this, many players treated me with a great deal of respect and kindness and were just generally very nice when I was betting big. They thought I was rich, so they treated me differently, which is a sad comment on society. Now I'm gonna share with you some of the biggest mistakes I made and what I wish I'd done differently, including this mess of a situation. But first, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, Private Internet Access. Don't you hate it when casinos are demanding to see your ID, even though you have no requirement to give it over? Me too, that's because it's our private data and we have the right to keep that private. Well, one of the things that people don't consider nearly enough is their privacy online. And one of the best ways you can help keep your data private is by using a VPN like Private Internet Access. Private Internet Access is the world's most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. They never record or store user data and their no logs policy has been proven multiple times in court. But what does private internet access do? Well, it changes your IP address and reroutes your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel. That means it hides your online activity from your internet service provider, network administrator, and government sensors. They're the most customizable VPN on the market, as well as having their code 100% open source, which means anyone can check how secure and private their service is. Almost no other VPN is that transparent. Private internet access can also be used to bypass those pesky region blocks. So if you wanted to play, say, an online poker tournament that was only available in Bosnia and Herzegovina, boom, now you're in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It also blocks trackers and malicious websites automatically, and they've got 24 seven customer service. I personally think that these days having a VPN is essential, and I know a lot of you will think that already, but maybe you've not got around to getting one yet. Well, Private Internet Access are offering you lot 83% off and four months free and a 30 day money back guarantee. Just use the link privateinternetaccess.com slash Stephen Bridges. Here's what I wish I'd done differently and things I learned on this trip. We'll start with this story, and this is a really stupid one. Not my smartest moment, but I'm not here to hide the stupid things I've done. I'm here to shine a light on them for people to enjoy. So one time I was playing in this casino, I got backed off, had my money, got in my car, and I counted my cash, which is something I do in the car, provided there's no one else around. I am kind of careful. After I'd counted it, I put it under my leg and sat on it whilst I got my phone out to figure out what I was going to do next. This took me a little bit longer than I normally would have. Then I decided I'm going to get my camera out and film, but my camera was in the boot. So I opened the car door, stepped out, and the money that I was sat on that I'd forgotten about flew everywhere. All these hundred dollar bills just blew out into the car park. So me, in a massive panic, jump out of the car, run and I'm scrambling, grabbing as many of the bills as I can, throwing them in the car, running and grabbing more bills. And somehow, miraculously, I managed to get every single bill because when I counted it, it was the same amount of money. But the result was all these crumpled bills in the car and me feeling like a proper idiot. If it had been just a bit windy, all of it would have gone. Okay, I don't want to relive this story for any longer. There's a lot of things I learned on the trip and things I wish I'd done differently. Here's a few that stand out. Diving in with a 200,000 pound bankroll was ludicrous. If you're playing with those stakes, that much money as a beginner, that is an unnecessarily reckless thing to do. I don't regret it per se. However, if I was advising new card counters, I definitely say play at much lower stakes on a smaller bankroll as you get some experience. Because when you're new, you don't know what you don't know. A case in point, I was gonna mention this later, but it ties in quite nicely. When we started, I had no proper understanding of the concept of N0. Or more accurately, I misunderstood N0. N0 is the mathematical concept that basically tells you as a card counter how long it will be before you're sort of guaranteed to be in profit. That's a massive oversimplification, but we shall continue. Because I didn't understand this properly, I thought it would take way less time to be guaranteed in profit. And as a result, my investor thought the same thing. 
and it's just never good to be working with wrong data when you're gambling with lots of money. Next thing, and this is a weird thing to mention, but I'll mention it anyway, I should have got a refresher driving lesson as soon as I got to Washington. I drive at most once per year in the UK, because I live in London, we've got good transport. So getting to a country that I've never driven in before and has slightly different road rules, like you can turn right on a red light, baffling to me. I should have just got a quick driving lesson to get me more comfortable on the road. A lot of my stress at the beginning of this trip came from me being not good at driving. I should have planned more before even getting on the flight. I should have mapped out all the casinos I was gonna visit on Google Maps, lots of little pins and had routes and just knew what I was gonna do. I figured this out each day at the beginning of the day and that ate into quite a bit of time that I could have spent at the tables. I wish I'd had a better system for managing the cash. I kept some of the bankroll money in my wallet as well as my own money because I thought that would look more natural at the tables to be using just one wallet and taking all the money out from there. However, it became quite difficult to keep track of how much of it was my money and how much of it was the bankroll money. That sounds kind of silly because you'd think you'd be very clear on what you bought in for, but sometimes if you had to rebuy a few times in a session, you're also keeping the running count. Sometimes it just got a little bit unclear with the money and it would have just been much simpler to have two wallets or just two different places for different cash sources. Finally, I wish I had a better understanding of the law. Laws do vary state to state and although I had a good understanding-ish of gambling law, there are definitely things that I wasn't 100% sure of. And being in these difficult situations with security and casino staff, all of my confidence and my ability to stand my ground came from me being confident in the laws. And there were times when I wasn't sure if I was right, but I had to really double down and commit and it would have been better if I just had a really good legal understanding, particularly for situations like tribal casinos where the laws can be different. Please give me a follow on Instagram because it boosts my self-esteem. I'm also gonna post quite a rambly iPhone video that I'm gonna shoot just now, talking more about my experience. And that's gonna be on my Patreon. So thanks for everyone that supports me there. This video concludes the Washington trip, but I am just getting started on my card counting life. Lots more to come. <laughs>